We're going to get it straightened out one day. But I've struggled with this, and I'm struggling even tonight. Didn't help the fact that all day I've been on the phone with a situation, and my heart is broken. But I want to read this first to you, these two verses. Fear thou not. Stop. We generally just fear what we don't know. We don't know, so we fear the future. But notice what God says. Fear thou not. You know what's going to happen. For I am with thee. For the unknown, God is with thee. But notice, be thou not dismayed. That's discouraged, depressed, downhearted. And we're usually depressed about the things we know. So notice what he says, for I am thy God. So whether it's the unknown where he'll be with us, or whether it's the known that he's our God, he's going to be with us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to see us through no matter what our troubles are. But he goes on to say, really encouraging, I am thy strength. I am thy strength. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will hold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Flip on down to verse 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. There's two of the greatest verses for Christians who are going through terrible times, tough times, troubling times. To know when you don't know the unknown that, that God is going to be with you, God's going to help you. And when you know, you know what's going on, that God's going to be there. That God's going to take his hand of righteousness, his powerful hand, his right hand of righteousness, and grab your hand, and he's going to walk through it with you. That's a powerful thought, by the way. And as we go through trying times and difficult times, we probably have asked God some very serious questions. We may have had some doubts. I, I, people always talk about the doubt of their salvation. And I'm going to give you a good illustration if you ever have doubted your salvation. Let's say you're walking down the road. Put that down there. Let's say you're walking down the road and you look down and there's a $100 bill. Now, that's not a $100 bill, but let's pretend like it is. <laughs> You're walking down the road, and you look down, there's a $100 bill. And you look around, and you say, wow. You reach down, and you pick it up. And you put it in your wallet or your purse. And you're walking on down the road, and you say, I really didn't find a $100 bill. So you take out your wallet and your purse, and you pull out that $100 bill. You would have never doubted you had a $100 bill unless you picked up that $100 bill. You can never doubt what you didn't have. Unsaved people don't doubt their salvation because they don't have it. If you have doubt, it's because you've got something and devil is trying to tell you you don't have it. So understand that. When you have doubt, that is a good sign you're a Christian. It's one of the evidence of being a Christian. One of these days I'm going to talk about, about seven evidence that you know and know that you're a Christian. These are the signs of your saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want you to know, young people every age, when you start doubting your relationship with God, it's because either you're walking away from it or you're drifting or Satan working on you powerfully. First evidence you're ever saved is Satan's going to work on you. It never bothers you because he's got you. But the minute God takes him out of his kingdom, the Satan's kingdom, he's going to fight to get you back. The question is like, God, why are you allowing me to go? Like, why is into my husband, my wife, my child, my grandchild, my mother, my father, or my sister. Going through all this that they're going through now. Why are you allowing this? Same for a lot of things he has nothing to do with. When the pressures of life, the emotional, psychological pressures, physical pressures, the spiritual pains and pressures, when all of those things begin to flow on you, most likely, likely you're going to ask questions. And you're going to have doubts. Why am I going through? I thought I was a Christian. I thought I was a child of God. I, I wouldn't treat my children this way. God, why are you treating me this way? And don't look at me like I'm a bad guy. Every one of us have had those questions. We just don't want to admit it many times because we want to look spiritual. God doesn't care how spiritual you look. He wants to see how spiritual you are. So listen to me this tonight. These questions souls of so many saints, and I've had the pleasure of, to minister to some of these great saints. They've gone through business failures. They've gone through family difficulties. They've gone through 
death discouragement, and they go through itself of their relatives. And I've sat with them, and I've cried with them, and I and I prayed with them. Can I insert something? The best ministry you can ever have is the ministry of presence. What is the ministry of presence? It's being there. I got a card from a lady, and she this is what she said. <clears throat> Thank you for being with me during the death of my husband. The encouraging words you said at that funeral home the night we were at the family visit, parent, friends, have meant so much to me. I had a problem with the letter. I was so shook up. I was so broken. She's one of my best friends. That all I did is sit beside her, hold her hand, and cry. But being there and holding her hand and crying, that's not sympathy, that's empathy. And the world doesn't need sympathy. I feel sorry for you. They need empathy. I am sorry with you. I am, I'm hurting with you. I'm walking with you. I'm holding your hand. And that's what God does for us. He doesn't feel sorry for us. He's walked the path with us. He's walked the path before us. He knows what we're going through. There's nothing you can go through that God, Jesus' Son, has never went through. He knows what you're going through. So don't be troubled by your questions. Be encouraged by them. Why would God allow his children to go through such pain and struggles and agony? Why would he do this? And why would he allow us to have such worry and anxiety? We're dealing with so many devastating problems today. I've been in ministry long enough to know some of the things I was taught before I got into ministry to get into ministry. I, I don't deal with them. A lot of things I should have been taught, I didn't get taught because they wasn't even happening then. And I've had to deal with things that the only thing I could turn to was the Word of God. And that's the best thing to turn to. It sharpened my iron. It made me look into God's Word. It made me cry out to God. It made me say, God, I'm not going to let them leave without, without not having hope of your Word, hope of your presence. And I want everybody to know that we as children of God ought to offer hope to everybody around us. And when they're crying, we ought to be crying. And when they're hurting, we ought to be hurting. The church should always hurt when a member of the church hurts. We ought to cry. We ought to reach out to them. And I thank God that this is the type of church. I've been around numerous one of you. And when you've told me about a death, and so, and I watched your eyes, and I saw in your eyes that you cared. And the old saying, you're going to hear me say it many times, people don't care, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I don't have a right to preach. I don't have a right to teach. I don't have a right to visit if I don't care. And many times if you ask me to pray for you, I'm going to pray for you right then. You didn't ask me to pray for you tomorrow. You asked for me to pray right now. You're hurting right now. <coughs> the problem may get worse tomorrow. And so we need to pray. I am struggling, as you will see. What if I, tonight, for some wonderful reason, I pulled out my magical wand? And I walked through the auditorium and I said, Al, what's your what problem? If I could touch you with this wand, 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 this wand, and get her one thing in your life, what would you, don't tell me, but what would you ask for? And so you tell me, to pop, and it's gone. And I went down through the congregation, pop, and it's gone. Don't you be taking pictures of me with a wand. <laughs> oh, we got a good preacher. He's got a magical wand. <laughs> That'll go over great. To be honest, deep down in our soul, every one of us, are hurt by something, are hurting by something, are dealing with things you don't want to deal with, or making decisions you thought you'd never have to make. And I know within your heart, I am human also, that I'd want that magical wand to hit me. Well, not that hard, but <laughs> hit me and get rid of that problem. But I'm going to tell you something. We don't have a magical wand. wand. I'm going to blow it, ain't it? Blow it. We, want, we have a wonderful Savior. We have a wonderful Savior. And He can walk through this congregation and He can touch every one of us. He can change things like that. I want a Savior that's alive and well. I want a Savior that can answer my questions. I want a Savior that's with me on the rocky road of life. I want a Savior who literally loves me because I am His child. Fear and worry and even panic is controlling so many of us. And the question is, will we ever get back to normal in America? Ever since the pandemic, that's been the question. And they'll talk about now's the new normal. Let me tell you a little secret. There's never been a normal. There's never been a normal. You look around this right now and you see all the things that's happening. 
But I'll be honest with you tonight, the news media and the politicians and the powers to be are literally controlling the minds and lives of Americans. Literally, the media are deeply, really daily pumping in garbage in our minds, half-truths and even lies to keep the public in a panic mode. Wanting the public to say, help me, help me, help me. Understand this. Whatever the government helps you with, it's going to cost you something. It's going to take something out of your wallet. It's going to take something out of your life. Government never gives you anything without taking something back. And what they take back is a long time, and what they give you is a short time. Food shortages. Listen, you're the market week after week to food prices. I go back. I mean, some of the food is going up so high, it's like a, a, a swinging wheel. It's shh, that's how fast. Have you went to the food, uh, the food market or wherever you go, Walmart or wherever? One week, you go back the next week, and some of the food has almost doubled. I was walking out of Walmart the other day, and there was a can of pork and beans. There's some special brand pork and beans, two dollars and thirty nine cents. And it was on the for, it was on the sale aisle. I wished it would sell away. Two dollars and thirty. I ain't paying two dollars and thirty five cents or whatever it was for a pork and bean can. I'm not gonna do it. I'll go and find a cheap one. Hey, by the way, they taste the same. You say, no, they don't. It's because they season it different. Get the season. It's a whole lot cheaper and season it for yourself. In fact, prices of food, as I said, even paper products and everything, medicine is getting out of sight. I believe that much of the hype is a man-made and man-induced hype. It has cost all of us. Listen, God's still on the throne. God's still in control. God knows all, all the things. God's got this. What we've got to do is not turn to our bank account, but turn to our bank of heaven and let him help us through this pathway. The Word of God deals with all kinds of suffering and really gives us numerous reasons why we suffer. Just, just in passing, we've got to understand the powerful nature of sin. We are born in a sin nature. We've got to understand that. not going to go into it. We need to understand the purpose of godly character, how it's developed, and I'm not going to go into that. We also have to understand that the revelation of Satan's true nature. Literally, Satan is truly an evil, diabolical, and destructive individual. You look what he did to Job. What Satan does is he grabs you, he uses you, and when he's through with you, he's going to let you commit suicide or he's going to kill you. The ultimate gift of Satan to people is death. When Satan gets you and you adopt Satan or you go to Satan or you go Satan's way, he's going to let you go as far he, as he can use you in life to get someone else to follow that pathway. And when he's through with you, he's going to kill you. Now I work with the coroner's, coroner's office in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The tragedy of suicides, the tragedy of overdoses in our, town, in our county, Spartanburg County, was unbelievable. Every week, every day. And all it is, is Satan getting his final say on that life. He's destroying us, folks. He's destroying the church. He's destroying our families. He's robbing our families. He's robbing our church of precious souls. Satan knows what he's doing. But this, this evening, I just want to talk to you a little bit about... Some <coughs> oh. Could someone give me some water, please? Thank you. It's y'all's fault. It's Missouri's allergies. <laughs> Is anybody going to take the blame for that? How many say amen to that? How many have allergies? How many want to give your allergies away? <laughs> Gift givers. Let me give you about three important principles from the Word of God that really helps us there in difficult times. When we're going through difficult times, remember this. God is nearer than you think. Principle number one, the nearness of God. we got to understand when we go through something, God has not left us there. God does not leave us there. God is going to be there. One of the greatest principles I ever found out, Psalms 145, verse 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon Him, to all that call upon Him in truth. As we go through life, the difficulties, the trials, the tribulations, and the troubles we go through, remember God is just a cry away. He's just a prayer away. He's there for you, and He will always take, for, take care of you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. He is always there. And one of the problems that Satan will whisper in our ear when we're going through difficult times, God has forsaken you. If, you're, if you call Him a father, and a father would do that to me, I wouldn't call Him much of a father. And that has been used on children in school, high, a grade school, high school, junior high. They tell them, even a public school system will tell them, you talk about God, 
Why, if you have a God, God created this world, God created you, then why all the tragedy happening? I have an answer for that. I won't give it to you tonight. But that's how they get in the minds of children. He's a good God, then why am I hurting? He's a good guy, why is this child dying of cancer? He's a good God, why is he taking good people out of our lives? He's a good guy, why is he allowing suicides and murders? And why, why is he allowing school shootings? And it gets in the mindset of people. And the mindset of people in America right now is if you want to get rid of school shootings, you take away the gun. I don't know a gun yet that shot anybody. And they talk about, you know, there's, there's so many tragedies about the shooting. So because there's guns and they're shooting, we've got to take, care of the, take guns away and there'll be no more deaths with, by guns. If that's true, there's more death by automobiles. Let's just take away the automobile. And when you go down through life, you'll find out there's a whole lot more deaths and all these things. And the problem is not the item. The problem is the person with the item. It's the heart of that person. They're evil. They're diabolical. And I'm telling you, when you get in trouble, when, you're, when your life is just going under, God is where you need Him. God is always there. Lord, we pray so many times. We have fasted, we say, so many times. And we've got other friends and family members crying out to you. But why haven't you intervened? My daughter, my son is on drugs. Why haven't you stopped him? Why haven't you intervened? And then you go to his funeral and you say, God, I prayed. I prayed with all my heart, with everything in me. I believed you. I trusted you. And you let me down. You let my son die in such a brutal way. Oh, God, why did you allow this person to murder my child or rape my daughter? Well, why did you allow that to happen to me? I loved you. I trusted you. You blew it, God. Now, before you get so religious on your mind and think, well, you ought not to be saying that. Every one of us tonight have had some of those thinkings in our own mind when tragedies come to our home. I've been around long enough, and I've watched families fall apart, and I've cried out to God, oh, God, why do you hurt that individual so much? It is something that's going to hurt them the rest of their life. God, they were a good person. They were a godly person. They loved you. Why did you allow Satan to destroy their marriage? And something happens and we start, start, to, start to ask God, Lord, have I sinned? Is this happening to me because of some sin that I've created or that I've done in the past? Lord, am I truly a Christian? Excuse me. What have I done to deserve this? Lord, do you care any longer? Lord, I feel so alone. Have you left me? Have you abandoned me? Have you walked away from me? Do you even hear me? So in isolation and loneliness and frustrations, we wait and we wonder. And there's not a person here that sometime in your Christian walk, walk or life that you haven't been isolated and lonely and in frustration. And folks, when something happens to your life, it is easy for people to judge you or you think they're judging you. And that's another tool that Satan uses to get us to say, God is not for me or with me. Ever been there? You look in God's Word, there's so many godly examples of godly people who've been right where some of you are tonight. You remember David? A man after God's own heart who experienced an isolation feeling in his heart. Isolated from God. Remember, he, he was a God, in fact, he was a man after God's own heart. And there he was most of his life running, hiding in caves. Because the man that the children of Israel appointed as king was not the one that God wanted. And so God allowed David to be anointed and be the king, and Saul hated him. David in Psalms 13, 1, David cried out to God, and here's what he said, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David was in a cave, dark and dreary and isolated. And Saul was out there with his armies trying to kill him and destroy him. Sometimes we feel we're just like we're in a cave by ourselves, and everybody comes by, says the wrong thing. I tell people this. If you don't want to say, the best thing to do is not say anything. 
<coughs> I, I think I told you before, but one night I was, one day I was going through the, the checkout line at Walmart. Uh, I spent some time in Walmart. By the way, Walmart's a great, great place to go witness. It's a great place to lose your mind, too. But I come up to the register, and I was trying to be nice and friendly, and, you know, I mean, I look friendly, I look so nice, so I said, well, I better play the part. So I looked down, and the cashier was there, and I said, when's the baby due? She wasn't pregnant. That's a bad place to be in, by the way. What do you say? What do you say then? Oh, I'm sorry. You look like it. No, that, you don't say that. You get out of there as fast as you can and leave them a tip. <laughs> leave your groceries there. Just get out. David, a man after God's own heart, yet was in very difficult times. He was running for his life. Notice Psalms 13.1. Notice that David, who was loved God and obeyed God, and yet in a time in his life believed in God, but he believed that God had forsaken him when he needed him the most. Ever been there? He felt alone and he felt deserted. What about Job? I talked about him this morning. Job was one of the most God-fearing men. He loved the Lord and he served the Lord. In fact, he died, literally tried to die for the Lord, almost died. And remember, he lost everything he had. He lost his children. He lost his wealth. He lost his servants. He lost his reputation. And he lost all his friends. And his wife said, curse God and die. I remind you of Job 23, verse 1 through 9. Here's Job talking. Job answered and said, even to the day of my complaint bitter, my stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him, and I fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he had, would answer me, and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he, want, he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered for every, from every judge? Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. Backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he does work. <clears throat> I, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. Wow. This is a man of God saying, where is God when I need him the most? Everywhere I look, he's not there. I look up, I look down, I look to the right, I look to the left. He's nowhere. And you have Job's three comforters. And if you are at that type of comfort, stay out of the hospital when I'm there. Man came to the hospital, and <clears throat> he was a Job's comforter. This man had a big old growth on his stomach. Job's comforter looks at the man and said, Oh, bless your heart. My uncle had that and he died. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's one of the worst diseases you can ever have. You'll suffer the rest of your life. Here's this person laying in a hospital bed. And here comes a godly, quote, man, a Christian man or woman, and they walk in the room, and by the time they get through, you don't feel better, you feel bitter. You feel like, oh, no. I thought the doctor's diagnosis of me was bad, but what they got through, it's worse. Church, listen, it's natural. It's a natural experience, that feeling of isolation, that feeling of loneliness, or deserted by God during difficult times. But listen, God's word assures us that the Heavenly Father will always be near us, his presence surrounds us. And even though he may, we not feel him, listen, he's right there with us. You don't have to see him or sense him for him to be there. He's ever there. God has set boundaries around us. And when you get to that boundary, I want to tell you something. God will come at that instant and stop you right in your tracks. You're not going to fall over the cliff. because He's the one that made the cliff, but he also is the one who has made a basket over that cliff that when you fall, you'll fall into his arms. That's the God I serve. Sometimes God feels a million miles away. Have you ever prayed? And it doesn't seem like your prayers come through. Have you ever prayed and you can't even sense God? And in your prayer, you want to say, God, where are you? I need you right now. I don't need you tomorrow. I need you right now. You ever prayed that? Remember in Luke chapter 24, on the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Remember they were very discouraged disciples. They loved the Lord, they followed the Lord, but also they were there at Jesus' crucifixion. And they saw him die, and he said where they said, you know, I, they knew that he was supposed to rise from the dead, but they left before he did. 
And on the road in Massas, they were discussing each other how depressing it was. Their leader, the one they had all their hopes in, the one that they trusted with all their life was gone. He deceived us. And Jesus appeared on the road. Isn't it amazing how Jesus appears sometimes at our worst times? And he appeared on the road and he started walking beside him. They didn't even know it was Jesus. It tells me something. Sometimes Jesus walks with us and we don't even know it. And they even talked to him. They didn't know it was Jesus. But all of a sudden their eyes were open and they realized he was real and he was there. God has promised never to leave us or forsake us. The songwriter wrote these words. I've seen the lightning flashing and I've heard the thunder roll. I've felt sins breaking, dashing, try to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of my Savior telling me still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me. The course goes, no, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, to cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us. That doesn't sound like Jesus doesn't care, does it? If he's God, and he is, why would he tell us to do something that he couldn't help us with? Why would he give us a promise that he couldn't fulfill? And he said, I'll never leave you alone. I'm here to take, he always comes to us. We don't have to go to him, he's always there. And by the way, when you feel lonely, he's in that room of loneliness. And he knows what loneliness meant. Principle number two, when we're going through difficult times, always remember that he's never late, and he's never behind schedule. The principle is the principle of timing. Now I realize that God answers on his own timing. We live in an instant world. We want instant eggs, instant everything, instant potatoes. By the way, they don't taste as good as real potatoes. <laughs> but what, you know what? We're so, we've got to have everything right now. Everything's got to be microwave. Everything. Don't ask me to interpret that. But we want a two minute egg in one minute. Everything has to be fast. We pray, and we think God is like a microwave, and when we pray, bam, it's done. No, it's not. God doesn't work that way. Look, we're going through difficult times and disturbing times and disgusting times and discouraging times. We have an inner desire to want God right there. Do we not? We want His immediate action, His immediate uh, attention. Sometimes God seems like He's very slow. We deal with present situations right now. We're in the midst of that situation, so we want God to be there. We want to sense Him. We want to feel Him. And so we begin to get discouraged why God is not here right now. Remember the writer who wrote the song, Four Days Late? It's about uh, the story in John 11, especially verse 5. It says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. You remember the story of Lazarus? He got sick. In fact, he got sick to the point of death. And they waited on him, worked with him. Finally, they sent a message to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Do you hit, notice the, emph uh, the emphasis there? Lord, the one you love is sick. So they really thought that Jesus would see that and he'd come running. Days went by, days went by, and finally he died. Can you imagine the disappointment in their eyes and in their minds? But here comes Jesus. Remember Martha? Martha said and went out to Jesus, running to him, and here's what she said. If you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But you got to read in between the lines. Jesus, what is the matter with you? I mean, wh where have you been? He was your best friend. We told you he was dying. He died because you didn't get here soon enough. We sent an urgent message. It was a cry for help. Now, my brother, your dear friend is dead because you waited to come. Wow. Wow. Jesus doesn't rebuke her. What does Jesus do? He walks over to the grave. Lazarus, come forth. He comes walking out of there. <laughs> you know, Jesus has a purpose for everything he does and the timing and everything. Waiting is good for us because waiting makes us really rely upon God. Waiting really tells us how faithful we are to God. Really, waiting really tells us how much we do love God. They thought Jesus was too late. But according to the story, the scripture, he was right on time. Jesus comes at the exact time that he didn't come to send the exact message we need at that time when he comes. Mary believed Jesus because of what they observed. But folks, when Jesus was late, 
the eyes of Mary and Martha, they realized at that time they really didn't trust Jesus as a Savior because he let them down. He came at the wrong time. He came too late. Church, listen. God has and God is and God never will handle anything too late. There's not a situation that God's going to be too late for. Whatever we are going, wherever we're going through God, God has it and whenever we're going through it. For as long as we're going through it, understand this. God has a purpose. God has a reason. God has a lesson for us. And it's always for our good and always for his glory. Romans 5, 3 and 4 says that suffering builds character. <laughs> Some of you say, well, amen to that. If that's true, I bet I'm the greatest character in the world. There's a story of a, a man who he found an emperor, emperor moth, a cocoon, and he w- took it home and watched that cocoon. For days upon days. One day there appeared a little opening in the cocoon. And he watched it. The man sat there and watched it for hours. He saw the body start to struggle to come out of that little hole. And he watched it as it struggled and struggled. And all of one moment he stopped struggling. There was no movement. There was no progress. He appeared at that moth. He, got, he figured, well, the moth too, too weak, you can't come out. So he took some scissors out of his kindness and opened the hole and pulled that moth out. But when we pulled him out, that moth was swollen and his wings were shriveled. What he did not realize was the reason why the, the moth had to come out of that cocoon that way and struggle and suffer. Because when he came out of that hole, the, the hole, that, that cocoon, put pressure on his body which sent the, the liquid to his wings. And when he come out, because now his wings are full, he could fly. That man watched that, that moth, and the rest of that moth's life, it could only go in a circle. Body too big, wings so shriveled, it couldn't help him. And the man caused that, that moth to come out to die. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a child of God, you're in a cocoon. And you're going through a hole. And God knows what he's doing. And you're going to struggle. And it's sometimes you're going to stop. But as long as you're struggling and as long as you're coming out, as long as you're developing yourself, you're going to become what God wants you to be. But it's through suffering and it's through struggle. Every suffering that you go through has a reason, has a purpose. We don't see it when we're struggling. We don't like it when we're struggling. But if you want to have wings that fly above the eagles, you want to have wings that will soar above the clouds and be like the eagle, then you have to struggle to get there. Listen, just like a moth, we can't achieve freedom. We can't achieve flight until we struggle. And we are children of God. And if it was all right for Jesus to suffer for us, is it not all right for us to suffer for him? Number three, when we are going through struggles, listen to me carefully, in difficult times, remember that God challenges us to rely on him. Principle number three is our reliance upon God. Isaiah 41.10 again, fear thou not, for I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will hold thee up with the right hand of my righteousness. Folks, when Job lost all of his sons and daughters and everything he had, and stricken with painful sores all over his body, listen, it would have been easy for him to blame God and said, I'm through with you, God, I'm leaving you. If this is what I get, serving you and loving you, I don't want any part of it. But he didn't do that. Instead, the the Bible says that Job fell to the ground in chapter 1, verse 20, and worshiped God. Wow. It's easy to sing praise songs and all that stuff when everything's going all right, but it's difficult when you have to come up here and sing a praise song that inside of your heart you're struggling, you're painful, you're sad, you're sorrow, you're struggling with something, and yet you've got to sing the praises of God. You've got to have a smile on your face and joy in your heart when sometimes you just don't feel like it. And don't look at me that way. Every one of us has come a time in our life, we just don't feel like worshiping the God. We don't feel like singing. Preacher, shut up. I don't want to hear that joyful message. I don't want to be joyful. Don't look at me that way. We've all been there. Joy comes in the morning. It comes in the morning. What does that mean? There is a night before morning. There is struggle before there is satisfaction. 
God is fixing you to be what he wants you to be, developing you to be strong in the Lord. And if Job can do it, and he was a son, then we can do it. Job grasped his faith in God, even though his life was filled with pain and his life was filled with agony. He didn't know the future, but he knew the Father. That's powerful. We may not know what the future holds, and we don't, but we know who holds the future. We have a Father that we can lie on and we trust in. We ought to be like a little Baptist minister. He's pastoring this church for years. He went to the doctor just for a regular checkup. The doctor said to the minister, Sir, you're in stage four cancer. You only have about two months to live. He could have had an attitude. He could have said, God, I've preached, I've served, I've been faithful to the church for all these years. And this is what I get? Lord, I quit. I've got two months to live. I'm going to do the best. I'm going to just have joy the rest of my life. You know what he didn't do that? The church hardly knew it. Just a few knew it. But he'd get up there and preach every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. In his final message, let me quote what he said. Some of you have asked me if I'm mad at God for this disease that has taken over my body. I'll tell you honestly that I have nothing but love in my heart for the Lord. He didn't do this to me. We live in a sinful world where sickness and death are curse, is the curse of man. That curse of man brought this on me. And I'm going to be a better place where there will be no tears and no sorrow and no heartache and no pain. So don't feel bad for me. Besides, our Lord suffered and died for our sins. Why shall I not share his suffering? And then he broke out in this song. In his weak voice, he was so weak he was trembling. But he sang the best he could. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. How happy are the saints above who once went soaring there. But now they taste the unmingled love and the joy without a tear. The consecrated cross I'll bear. Till death shall set me free. And then go home my crown to wear. For there's a crown for me. The words that morning were the last words he said to that congregation. That week he passed away. He slipped into eternity. He slipped into his glorious home. And his great anticipation was just a few days after that words. Church, we need that type of faith. It's a type of faith that trusts in God no matter what the circumstances are. Circumstances do not change our beliefs. Nor should they change our behavior. But they ought to change, put stronger Stronger, stronger, have a stronger and stronger faith in us. Oh, I wish I had time to go over some other things. We suffer, but listen, it helps us sense the nearness of God. It helps us to realize that God's always on time. And it always helps us realize we can still trust God. We still rely upon Him. Three important facts, and I'll hush. We need to grasp the fact that God will never leave us nor forsake us. He's a prayer away. Have you ever prayed and you're at your wits end? You lost your last friend. People would shake their head at you. Why, you're a preacher. Why, you're a Sunday school teacher. You're a heat lead, lead singer. Why are you acting that way? And in your closet, your prayer closet, all you can say is, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And you feel him grasp you and touch you and help you. Secondly, we need to grasp the fact that God is never late. He's always on time. And he always comes through for us in a better way than we ever th- thought he would do. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. And what we sometimes think, if I'll struggle and, and win this struggle and win this battle, this is what God's going to give you. No, no, no. When he, you get through it, God doesn't give you that. He gives you something so much better. And let us rest the fact that God can be trusted and God can be relied upon. God will never fail you. You can look to your right, you can look to your left, you look forward, you look backwards, and every one of us in this auditorium can be failed by every one of us in this auditorium. But when you look up, you find someone that will never fail you. 
Never. Never. You'll find someone that will never leave you alone. You'll find someone who loves you so much that if they have to, they'll pick you up and hold you and help you through the trial of life. And if you trip, he'll catch you. He's the warm blanket at night. He's that fresh shower in the morning. He's the fresh new clothes you wear that day. Oh, he's so refreshing. Maybe now you know why I struggle. We have to learn to grasp God and not grumble about we have to learn to turn to him and not away from him. We've got to learn. He's there waiting for you and me to cry to him. I'm not going to give an invitation as such tonight, but would you just bow your heads for a moment? Is there any music or anything?